How do you prevent OAS clawback? Hey, I'm Hervin Pessa. I'm a financial planner. In this video, I'll share 10 tips that can help you reduce OAS clawback. And if it's done properly, you could potentially put tens of thousands of dollars back into your pocket as you enter retirement. Before I continue, I have to highlight that these strategies are much more impactful if you plan ahead. Forecast your cash flows and your expenses before you even get to retirement. You also need to understand that mitigating OS clawback can provide you with significant benefits. However, getting the most out of the OAS and squeezing the most out of the OAS in itself is not a good retirement goal. It's not an end in itself. Rather, the goal for you is to have the income you need to sustain the retirement lifestyle that you want. I mention that because retirement decisions can be complex and focusing on such a small piece like the OS clawback could inadvertently cost more issues in your taxes, your investments, and overall your retirement income. You could potentially end up spending a dollar to save a dime. So before you even look at these strategies, you need to understand your income requirements. Look at your regular expenses as well as irregular things that will happen in your budget. Let's look at travel for example. You may have a budget for travel on a yearly basis as you enter retirement. However, there's also those bucket list trips, right? Like those once in a lifetime opportunities and destinations that you want to go on an adventure for. That perhaps will require additional funding. So that will be an irregular cash flow that you need to plan for. Or maybe you have the desire to help your children or grandchildren with their weddings, send them to school, or provide them a down payment for their home. By understanding your income needs, you will have a better view of what you need to draw from your investments and ultimately what your net income could be and whether you'll end up hitting that threshold for OS clawback consistently or even just a single year. Now, I'm a fee for service financial planner and I'm a licensed advisor, but I am not your advisor. So explore this information and review it with your planner. If you don't have one, consider working with us we can create a retirement income plan for you for a flat fee. Check out the description below so that you can see the link and figure out how that works. Now you need to understand though that with the retirement income plans that we've put together, the OS clawback saving strategies alone often pays for our fee. The OS clawback is based on your net income and not your tax payable or not even your cash flow. Therefore, the most important point when looking at clawback reduction is trying to reduce your net income. Learn more about net income in the previous video talking about the mechanics of the OS clawback. So let's look at strategies to reduce net income now. The first strategy you can employ to eliminate or to reduce OS clawback is by electing to split income. Try to balance out your income sources as you enter retirement. This requires advanced planning, especially with non-registered funds. However, it's well worth it. Remember that the current OS clawback threshold is $86,912. This means that if you and your spouse can split your income perfectly, you can have a combined income of $173,824 and still get the full OAS. Of course, it's not likely that you can split your income this perfectly, but here's a few things that you can consider to get your income as close to even as possible as you enter into retirement. Number one, you can elect to split pension income. If you have qualified pensions, you can actually get that tax between the two of you instead of just one person declaring it. Number two, use a spousal RSP as you plan or transition into retirement, especially if there's a big gap in income. That's when it makes the most sense. And if you're thinking about retiring before 65. Number three, your non-registered accounts, your non-registered assets should be held in a joint ownership as much as possible. I'll have a more detailed video talking about pension income splitting and income splitting in general. You can watch that over here or check the links. However, for now, you need to understand that the more even your income is as you retire, the more benefits you could potentially receive. Tip number two, watch out for capital gains. If you sell an asset that's grown significantly in value, 50% of that growth is taxable and gets added to your net income. This could be when you sell a cottage, a rental property, even portfolio of properties. Or more importantly, if you have your own business and you sell that, you have access to the lifetime capital gains exemption. However, any amount beyond the $971,190 will be treated as a capital gain. 
Let's say you bought a cottage 20 years ago in Banff, for example, and you got that for $600,000. Now it's worth 1.3 million, leaving you with $700,000 of gain. You would have to report $350,000 as taxable income. Even if you own that with your partner, that's $175,000 each if you owned it jointly. That will automatically wipe out your OAS, at least for one year, maybe even longer, depending on how you spend or invest the net proceeds. If you have a significant unregistered investment portfolio, be careful about this. If you own stock or any investments outside your RSPs, your RIFs, or TFSAs, chances are you may have a significant capital gain. Consider crystallizing some of those gains before you start your OAS or before you even enter into retirement. Certainly, if you have room in your TFSA or RSP, consider transferring those in to those registered accounts. Tip number three. Consider harvesting losses. Continuing on the discussion about capital gains, the opposite can also be true. What if you have portions of your portfolio that's not doing so hot right now, especially considering how the market was in 2022? You can actually use that to your benefit. You can use tax loss harvesting as a way to offset any gains that you would otherwise realize if you needed to draw from your non-registered investments. They can cancel each other out, so to speak. However, take special note here. You need to understand that net income considers taxable capital gains net of any losses for this year. You may have capital losses that you carried forward from previous years. However, that will only reduce your taxable income, which is still a good thing, just not your net income. For you to uh, eliminate or reduce your OAS clawback and you're considering realizing a capital gain and you have some losses, you have to do it with losses that are present this year, not ones that you've incurred in prior tax filing. Tip number four, consider drawing down your RSPs sooner, maybe even sometime at 60 to 65. This is counterintuitive, I know because likely you've been piling tens of thousands of dollars into your RSPs every year as you sprint towards retirement. And the thinking for RSPs is usually, let's kick that tax can as far down the road as possible. And we've met clients that are bewildered when we recommend pulling out money from their RSPs sooner than later. But depending on your situation, you may actually be in a spot where the RIF minimum withdrawals triggers clawback later in retirement. Not only is that a concern with clawbacks, you might be in a situation where you're forced to draw down from your RIFs later and you no longer have any place, any tax advantage place to reinvest those assets. So in your situation, if you're going to be in that spot where there's a big RIF that you need to worry about, a systematic RSP meltdown might actually be in your benefit. There's other pros to this too. Consider that the RSP is a tax deferred asset. So if you don't have a spouse and you passed away, that whole balance is going to be recorded or reported rather as a taxable income in the year you pass. That's just a massive liability to your estate. So really consider drawing down from the RSPs and melting it down sooner rather than later. Tip number five, consider the impact of deferring your CPP or taking it early. This might be a misconception, but even at 65, you don't have to take CPP and OAS at the same time. By altering the timing between these two government benefits, you could actually reduce your net income or at least have some flexibility around it. Taking it early is easier to understand, right? Taking it early, your CPP is reduced. However, delaying it may be confusing since that actually increases your CPP benefit. However, this is a part of a holistic retirement income plan. By deferring your CPP, you would be able to draw down your RSPs faster without paying more tax. Think of your retirement income as a pie. You can reach your retirement income target by pooling four or five different sources together. In the slice, the size of each source of income may vary from year to year to year to get you to your retirement income goal. But by doing this, you would actually have the benefit of reducing your lifetime taxes and even maximizing your estate. Tip number six, deferring OAS. By deferring OAS, as discussed in point four and five, you can actually free up more of your RSP between the ages 65 to 70. Another benefit of deferring OAS is that this increases an inflation adjusted, potentially guaranteed source of income for you throughout your retirement life. Of course, by increasing your OAS benefit, there's simply more of it to be clawed back. Therefore, the threshold before your OAS is totally eliminated goes up. 
At 65, receiving the maximum benefit roughly translates to about 8200, 8250 every year. If you have that 15% clawback, the threshold you need to hit would be $141,000, right? However, at 70, that maximum goes up because at that point, the maximum OAS available to you is 11,000 roughly, given some inflation estimates. You need to earn $161,000 before clawback is fully eliminated. Tip number seven, use the TFSA. If you use the TFSA as a retirement savings tool, the income you take out from this is totally tax-free and will not increase your net income. Therefore, you will be allowed or you can use this to meet your cash flow needs without having to worry about the clawback. Remember though, what you spend is not the same as your taxable income. So you could take out hundred grand from your TFSA and it doesn't affect your OAS. If you have TFSA room and you have non-registered assets, it may be advantageous for you to realize some of the gains now and put that inside the TFSA as you're entering into retirement. Look back at point number two when you're thinking about the uh, capital gain situation. Timing when you lock in your gains can reduce your net income. So tying the TFSA back to point four, this makes sense to use when you're drawing down your RSPs early and you have TFSA room. If you don't need to spend all the RSP income, the RSP drawdown, you can then put that inside the TFSA. So you can continue to contribute to your TFSA even in retirement. And in the latter years, you could be in a position where most of your income is tax-free. If you're in that situation and have unused TFSA room, you can put the excess draws from the RSP into the TFSA as you continue to do this because the TFSA gets $6,500 of new contribution room every year and that's adjusted to inflation by $500 increments. Tip number eight, use a holding company. Admittedly, this is a stretch and won't apply to everyone because setting up and maintaining a holding company for your investments is simply not worth it if your only purpose is to prevent clawback or mitigate OS clawback. However, if you're retiring as a business owner who already has a corporation and you have significant assets inside that company, that can now become your holding company. This becomes another source of income that has flexibility. So before you decide to wind down your corporation, if there's assets in there, be sure to consult with your accountant or your planner before you do so. There are other benefits to maintaining a holding company in retirement. That's too nuanced to go through in this video, but if you're a business owner and you have a prof corp, for example, reach out to us because there are unique planning strategies available to you as far as managing which income source we can tap into any given year. As long as we look at your overall lifetime tax bill, we can actually save you a lot of money. Tip number nine, watch out for dividends. Review your asset allocation and your investment mix with your non-registered account. Capital gains don't really increase net income until the year that you sell and you crystallize that gain, right? On the other hand, if you have non-registered funds that produce dividends and interest income, that's reported at the end of the year, whether you spent it or not. Dividend income taxation is a little bit more nuanced, but here's what you need to know. Dividend income is grossed up when you're looking at your tax preferred income. Dividends from publicly traded Canadian companies, for example, are grossed up at 38%. Dividends from a private Canadian company, one that you own, will be grossed up by 15%. Meaning if you received $20,000 of dividends from the big five banks, because that seems to be the common example, you would add $27,600 to your net income even if you only got $20,000 in cash. By choosing or creating a portfolio that focuses on capital gains, this could be mitigated as far as your non-registered assets are concerned. So now you have to be really careful about where you're placing your investments. Reduce OS clawback tip number 10. Use a permanent life insurance plan if that makes sense for you. Just like the holding company, this is slightly more esoteric. I would not look at setting up a permanent life insurance policy simply to avoid OS clawback. However, for those who have significant assets and have already maxed out your RSVs and TFSAs and you have no more room and you still have a clear legacy goal, whether it's to give to a family member or a charity that matters to you through your estate, 
Permanent insurance is an effective way to do so when adequately funded, it can even become a tax-free source of income in retirement. I was a little hesitant to add this point here at the risk of sounding like an insurance shill, but the truth is this strategy is commonly used by wealthy families to facilitate tax efficient transfer intergenerationally. You can transfer wealth from generation to generation if this is done properly, as long as you're maintaining adequate resources as you enter retirement. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of things that you need to consider and you can do to put more dollars in your pocket by reducing the OS clawback. So be sure to consult with your advisor and your planner and see which one of these things could potentially apply to you. There are plenty of planning opportunities, including maximizing your income splitting. And that's exactly what we'll cover in the next video here, focusing on income splitting for individuals that are entering into retirement or those, those that are already retired. I'll see you there. If this video was helpful to you in any way, please give me a comment. Let me know which part of the country you're watching this from. Leave us a like, it really does help get this video across to more people that could benefit from it. Thank you so much. See you next time.